Değerli katılımcılar, ben WRI Türkiye İlke Direktörü Güneş Cansız. Hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum ve WRI Türkiye olarak bu yıl 12.sini düzenlediğimiz Yaşanabilir Şehirler Sempozyumuna hoş geldiniz diyorum. Bu yılki sempozyumumuzun ana temasını kentsel ısı adasını yönetmek, yaşanabilir şehirler için yenilikçi çözümler olarak belirledik. Bugün hızla büyüyen şehirlerimizin karşı karşıya olduğu önemli bir iklim sorunu olan kentsel ısı adası etkisini ele alacağız. Kentsel ısı adası özellikle yaz aylarında şehirlerin çevrelerindeki kırsal alanlara göre ortalama 3 ila 5 santigrat derece daha sıcak olmasına neden olur. Hatta bazı araştırmalara göre büyük şehirlerde bu farkın 10 santigrat dereceye kadar çıkabileceğini biliyoruz. Kentsel ısı adasının insan sağlığı üzerinde de önemli etkileri bulunur. Sıcak hava dalgalarının hava kirliliğiyle etkileşimi, astım, koa ve kalp krizi gibi ciddi sağlık sorunlarına neden olur. Kentsel ısı adası artan nüfus ve insan faaliyetlerinden kaynaklanan ısı nedeniyle önemli bir sorundur. Araç motorları, trafik yoğunluğu, klimalar, ısıtma sistemlerinin çalışması, endüstriyel işlemler gibi faktörler de bu ısıyı artırır. Ayrıca beton gibi şehirlerde ısıyı emen malzemelerin kullanımı, yoğun ve yüksek yapılaşma, yetersiz yeşil alanlarda bu sorunun küresel çapta yaygınlaşmasına neden olur. İklim değişikliği ise bu sorunu daha da belirginleştirir. Ancak bu durumu yalnızca bir risk olarak görmek yerine iklim adaptasyonu için bir fırsat olarak değerlendirmeliyiz. Bu nedenle de kentsel ısı adası sorununa karşı alınacak her önlem şehirlerin iklim adaptasyonuna da katkı sağlar. Bugün burada bu kritik konuya dikkat çekmek, şehirlerimizi daha yaşanabilir, iklime dirençli ve sürdürülebilir hale getirmek için çözüm yollarını tartışmak ve uluslararası alandaki iyi uygulamaları paylaşmak üzere bir aradayız. Katılımınız ve katkılarınız için şimdiden teşekkür ederim. Verimli bir sempozyum geçirmenizi diliyorum. Şimdi sözü ilk oturumumuz olan Kentsel ısı adasını anlamak, nedenleri, etkileri ve azaltma stratejilerini neden önce tüm konuşmacılarımıza ve dinleyicilerimize kısa bir hatırlatmam olacak. Etkinliğimize simultane tercüme hizmeti bulunmaktadır. Bu nedenle Türk dinleyicilerimizin İngilizce ve konuş, konuşmalar ve sunumlar sırasında aşağıdaki ekrandan tercüme ayarlarından Türkçe kanalına geçip Türkçe çeviriyi dinleyebilirler. Özellikle tüm panelistler ve moderatörler konuşma ve sunumlarını off kanalında iken yapmalılardır. Ayrıca tercümanımızın çeviriyi rahatça yapabilmesi için konuşma hızınızı dikkat etmenizi rica ediyorum. Anlayış için çok teşekkür ediyorum. Şimdi de sözü Tuğçe Hanım'a bırakıyorum. Çok teşekkürler. Çok teşekkürler Güneş Hanım. Herkese merhabalar. Ben Tuğçe Üzümoğlu. WRI Türkiye'de iklim çalışmaları yöneticisi olarak görev almaktayım. Bugün bu panelde kentsel ısı adasını anlamak, nedenleri, etkileri ve azaltım stratejilerine dair konuşacağız. Güneş Hanım'ın da bahsettiği gibi kentsel ısı adası etkisi şehirlerde giderek artmakta. Geçtiğimiz yaz İstanbul'da hissedilen sıcaklık 45 derecelere kadar yükseldi ve nem oranı ise bazı ilçelerde %95 üzerinde ölçüldü. Bugün bu sempozuma farklı şehirlerden katılan katılımcılarımız da eminim ki kendi şehirlerinde normalin üzerindeki sıcaklıkları hissediyorlardır. Ee, bir taraftan da şehirlerde emisyon salınları artmaya devam ediyor. Bu durum hava kirliliğini artırırken sıcak hava dalgalarının bu hava kirliliğiyle etkileşimi ise şehirleri büyük bir tehlikeyle karşı karşıya bırakıyor ve şehirlerimiz nefessiz kalıyor. Panelimizi başlatmak isterim. Sorularınız olursa ekranda yer alan Q&A soru cevap kısmından bizlere yazabilirsiniz ve konuşmalarını gerçekleştirmek üzere İlk sözü IFRC, Uluslararası Kızıl Haç ve Kızılay Dernekleri Federasyonu Türkiye, Delegasyon Başkanı Sayın Cesit Tamsın'a bırakıyorum. Buyurun Sayın Tam. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's really a privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Jesse Thompson and I am the head of delegation for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies here in Türkiye, based in Ankara. Um, It's really a privilege to be here to talk to you about this question of heat and livable cities, particularly in the context of a climate crisis. As the head of delegation, I'm going to talk about the growing threat that extreme heat plays, uh, the extreme heat uh, impacts on our cities and, and more importantly, on the most vulnerable people in our cities. And I'll, I'll share some really practical solutions that we've developed in order to respond to extreme heat and to the heat island effect. 
And this is an issue really close to my heart because it extreme heat is the deadliest climate related hazard. We tend to think of hurricanes like the hurricane that is is uh, making landfall in the United States, uh, you know, over last night and today about the the deadliest form of weather related disasters, but in fact extreme heat is killing more people in the world uh, and we anticipate that this will only get worse in the future as the climate warms it it silently claims the lives uh, of too many people and urban heat islands really exacerbate the issue of extreme heat where cities with their dense infrastructure lack of vegetation trap heat and make them even warmer than surrounding areas it disproportionately is a phenomenon that affects disproportionately the urban poor um, who often live in poorly ventilated areas, often live in areas with little access to cooling facilities, and those tend to be the, the parts of the city with the least green spaces and as a result, uh, the hottest places in a city. And those vulnerable people can be children, elderly, people with chronic illnesses, outdoor workers. Um, and we're really already grappling with the challenges of inadequate housing and limited access to health care for vulnerable groups and then layering extreme heat on top of this just makes it that much worse and compounds the vulnerabilities of communities. The statistics are alarming. 2023 was the hottest year on record uh, with over 3.8 billion people globally experiencing extreme heat at, on at least one day. Uh, and in South Sudan, we saw schools being forced to close due to soaring temperatures uh, exceeding 42 degrees, a reminder that extreme heat is affecting everyone around the world. However, one of the reasons I feel quite passionately about this question is that it is a very real threat and challenge, but heat related deaths are not inevitable. And actually with proper planning early action and inclusive strategies, we can mitigate the effects of extreme heat and we can save lives. In, in fact, it's not that costly to save lives if we raise awareness and if we work in partnership with others. IFRC has developed a fantastic resource that I have shared here on the screen and I really recommend uh, to others to check out the Heatwave Guide for Cities. And it's really a tool that's meant to assist city planners, policymakers, and communities to prepare for and respond to extreme heat. It talks about early warning, community engagement, and urban planning. And I think it's a great resource. And again, something that is a, a tool at our fingertips as we grapple with this issue. And one of the most powerful ways that we can uh, reduce heat fatal fatalities is through data driven early warning systems and that can help to ensure that authorities and communities prepare uh, and are ready and that they are have adequate early warning uh, when the heat is reaching that dangerous level and public awareness raising campaigns are really critical in that context so that it's not just a hot day but that it's actually a natural hazard that communities need to prepare for. My last assignment was in Greece, where they have been grappling with extreme heat for many years and where the city of Athens has really been um, tremendously impacted by extreme heat. And I was part of an effort to develop the anticipatory action program with the Hellenic Red Cross in order to create uh, a heat alert system that was data driven and allowed us to categorize heat waves in terms of their deadliness. Uh, so that communities could know when it was just a hot day versus when it was uh, too hot and dangerous to the most vulnerable. And you can see that here on the screen with the extreme temperature categorization system. And that allowed us to have a tool with early warning me measures that five days in advance would enable us to see an extreme heat wave on the horizon and begin to prepare and reach out to vulnerable communities. At the heart of any successful heat action is really that plan for community engagement um, and while immediate actions are necessary, we also know that long term solutions are needed to respond to extreme heat and that's about how we design and plan our cities and I think we're going to hear a lot more about that today in this discussion. 
urban areas need more green spaces, more parks, more trees, more water bodies um, that naturally cool the environment, uh, planting trees, rooftop gardens, in, installing reflective surface surfaces, all can help at reducing temperatures, particularly in highly populated areas. In Nairobi, the Kenyan Red Cross has worked with city planners and communities to map out micro heat islands in informal settlements using heat sensors, and that data was used to prioritize uh, investments for reforestation and other cooling interventions that offer that sustainable solution so that we mitigate that risk in the medium term. And, it, and we just cannot emphasize enough that extreme heat does not affect everyone equally. The elderly, the young, pregnant, uh, marginalized groups like migrants, for example, are particularly vulnerable. And social and health services must prioritize these groups by ensuring they have access to cooling centers, ensuring they have access to health care, and ensuring emergency assistance during heat waves. Heat waves, healthcare systems also have to be able to adapt as well. And what we've seen is that training healthcare workers to identify heat related stress and illness can really save lives. Um, we also know that all too often, people uh, who are vulnerable to extreme heat, particularly elderly, uh, die alone in their homes because there's no one checking in on them and you become uh, disoriented and delirious in the context of heat stroke. Uh, and so in Australia, the Australian Red Cross has developed something called Telecross Ready, which is a wellness check program with volunteers that check in on people who are pre-registered in advance of, an earth, of a heat wave, during the heat wave, in order to make sure that, that people are safe and that they get that escalated care, uh, health care services when they need it. Cities are really on the front lines of this crisis, but they can't tackle this problem alone. And municipalities have such a key role to play, but we have to foster collaboration between governments, between non-governmental organizations, between the Red Cross and Red Crescent local societies, between communities themselves and international actors like ourselves. And we've been really working to try to promote those integrated partnership-based solutions. We need to continue uh, to innovate, uh, we need to name heat waves, for example, where where we can use that data driven approach to heat categorization like we do for hurricanes in order to raise awareness and and foster that that uh, early warning uh, capacity for heat like we do for other kinds of natural hazards. Um, and as we reflect on the discussion today, we must really remember that the fight against extreme heat needs action by all of us and we're really committed as ifrc to working with our red cross and red crescent partners to working with cities and to working with scientists meteorologists national uh, national meteorological services and others in the healthcare profession to try to find solutions together to this challenge and to not only respond to the immediate needs of the most vulnerable in the context of extreme heat but also to help change our cities so that they are more resilient in the face of extreme heat in the future. I look forward to the discussion today. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to share our perspective on this issue. Thanks so much. Çok teşekkürler Sayın Tanıttın. Bu önemli verileri ve örnek uygulamaları bizlerle paylaştığınız için. Şimdi ise konuşmalarını yapmak üzere sözü WRI Brezilya Kentsel Gelişim Bölge Koordinatörü Sayın Bruno Inkoya bırakıyorum. Buyurun. So uh, first, I wanted to thank for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here uh, in my morning, uh, the afternoon in Turkey, uh, to discuss this important topic on how we can create cooler and healthier cities. Uh, so without further ado, let me start my presentation. So uh, as we, uh, as it was shown uh, before, and Jesse highlighted that. Uh, 2024 is already on the track to be the hottest year on the record, right? And just passing 2023, which means we are two years in a row, breaking records into the extreme uh, temperatures in our in our uh, globally. And uh, here are two pictures from this year that shows a little bit what is the scale of what is happening. And the left side we have a island in the Antarctic which is, you can see, is full of grass. It should be full of snow. Uh, and research are showing that the 
rate in which the Antarctic is greening is 30% faster than it used to be 40 years ago. And then in the right side, we have a picture of the country where I live in Brazil. Uh, we have huge fires in the country in the past month and the smoke could be seen from the space. So this just gives a, a idea of what is the size of the problem that we are facing. And how is that impacting cities? As Jesse said, heat is already the climate hazard that is killing the most and is expected to grow by 50% to 2025, uh, 2050. And not only causing uh, the loss of lives, but also economic losses. So cities are also expected to lose around 2% of the GDP by 2050 and around uh, five, five and a half by, the, by this century. But who will suffer the most? Of course, are those who lack access to proper infrastructure and opportunities in cities, uh, the populations from informal settlements and those with lower incomes. They lack access to proper infrastructure and therefore they're exposed to the impacts of this, uh, this heat waves. Here's a famous picture from the city where I'm, I'm born and raised in Sao Paulo. It shows the neighborhood of Morumbi and uh, Paraisopolis. In the right side, Morumbi is a rich neighborhood where you can see this fancy building. And then in the left side, you see the informal settlement. And uh, of course, you see clearly the inequalities here. And if you were to ask who is suffering most from heat, it's quite clear that the informal settlement is suffering the most. Uh, this is a recent research that shows that the neighborhood of Paraisopolis, it, it's uh, in average nine degrees hotter than the neighborhood of Norumbi, and mostly because the lack of green infrastructure. And this is a situation that is not exclusive to Sao Paulo. You see that all over the world, especially in the global south, which brings the question that is, how can cities uh, tackle heat while solving uh, social inequalities? And based on our research and work with cities, I want to highlight a few points that can uh, help elucidate how cities can have coordinated action towards uh, heat, including uh, embracing the, the challenge of uh, inequalities. First is to uh, understand the risks and recognize the risks. There's still a gap in knowledge compared to other climate hazards, as Jess was saying, like landslides and floods that have direct physical impacts. So cities need to develop maps and methodologies and communication strategies that properly identify and communicate about the heat risk and uh, what are the vulnerable populations. Second is that based on, the, this knowledge, based on this knowledge, create awareness and engagement between stakeholders to include them in policy design and decision-making process. Third is to center resilience in their investments. Uh, taking a evidence-based decision-making, they need to build proactive investments that address uh, hazards and inequalities. With this, they need to focus on heat, on health and uh, equity, uh, equity impacts. There are many ways in which cities can explore co-benefits from multiple solutions. So they need to put that in the heart, that in the heart of their projects. Uh, for this, they need to enable a innovative and nature positive environment for solutions. Think outside the box and leave siloed uh, uh, siloed solutions to explore social and economic co-benefits that we can uh, have, for example, for nature-based solutions. And last but not least, monitor the results, monitor what is that that is happening and share the knowledge so that uh, other cities and other stakeholders can learn from it. And uh, to illustrate this, I want to bring two examples of cities that are working on coordinated actions and, and policy at city level. The first is from the city of Campinas, here from the state where I live in Sao Paulo. Uh, in 2017, they have started working on ecosystems recovery, firstly mapping what were the connectivity corridors that they had in the metropolitan area and areas that they should focus to on for forest restoration. But after this initial push in 2017, they came with the question that, okay, we know what are the corridors that we have in the city, but where should we start and with what kind of actions? So in 2021, uh, with the support from the URI to a network called Cities for Forest, we helped the city in creating a nature-based solutions strategy to help them inco incorporate nature in the lens of the, this strategy uh, and also climate resilience uh, actions. 
In this work, what we did was that we mapped all the hazards that the city was exposed and including heat. We crossed this data with the social vulnerability and the environmental priority areas. And with that, we built a map for them showing what, which were the areas that they should focus to implement nature-based solutions that would help not only the environment, but also the people. Based on this, they also created a framework to evaluate what types of nature-based solutions they should focus based on the co-benefits that they would bring to communities like creation of jobs, shape effects, water quality, and other co-benefits that they can have from it. And they, uh, they shortlisted 14 nature-based solutions that they should implement. But the, of course, that it doesn't stop it didn't stop there. After this, they had to map how to integrate that in their local policies. And for this, they identified that uh, this roadmap that is shown in the upper part, that started with the definition of disparity areas, but then they, they needed to push for the integration of this, uh, of guidelines in their policy, including politic engagement, uh, evaluation parameters, monitoring parameters, in their policy. And now uh, they want to focus even more on the, the issue of heat. So through a new partnership with WRI and an organization that focuses on health research called Sourball, they will participate in the research to understand the correlations between urban heat and uh, health impacts. And they will uh, pilot a data-driven engagement process that will help to design policies and engage stakeholders uh, on this matter to create better, better policies and interventions in the city. So this is how uh, Campinas is planning to, to coordinate actions and create a solid green infrastructure uh, network in their city. But the city of Medellin, Medellin has already started this a few years ago. Between the years of 2016 and 2019, they implemented 36 green corridors in the city. That was done first by mapping connectivity corridors, just as Campinas uh, did. And together with the secretaries of environment and infrastructure, they implemented these corridors along water streams and mobility access in the city, adding 65 hectares of green areas. And these interventions were of different types and different scales, as we can see here, uh, like gardens in, in low-income communities, uh, blue-green infrastructure in mobility corridors, and also a uh, um, green walls in the public buildings. Here's the the city hall in the upper lower and the lower part. And the city is already collecting the results from that. So they monitored the temperatures in these areas, and after the intervention, they noted a a reduce of two Celsius degrees in the areas that received the intervention. For example, we have in the image here, the corridor of San Juan, and the left part is before the intervention and in the right part after they included the corridor, which showing the clearly the reduce in the temperature. But these corridors also work as green barriers absorbing pollutants from the air. And they also note said an increase in the, the local, in the local biodiversity and the engagement of communities. And it's not mentioned here, but they also noted a increase in the mobility, uh, in the mobility matters. Uh, like people were more uh, started to using more the the bike during their bikes during in the in the corridors, and it's expected that they have uh, reduced the deaths by 116 deaths to uh, 2030. So this is what Campinas and Medellin is doing. I hope this has uh, inspired you. Uh, we'll stop here. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll leave my contact as well. Thank you very much, Bruno. We are working on the development of the world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's world's Dr. Saif So first of all, thank you uh, for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to present some of our data work for modeling urban heat and helping city officials to tackle uh, extreme heat using data and maps. 
uh, with Elizabeth Wesley, my colleague, as part, we are part of the cities data team in WRI Ross Center, and we are working with the different cities around the world to help them to implement cooling infrastructure and maximize their impact. Next slide, please. So as the previous speakers already highlighted, heat is a growing hazard and we are registering during, during the last few years new records of temperature in different countries and uh, with different uh, with increase and in also in health impact. And cities uh, are significantly exposed to this hazard, especially because of urban heat island effect and due to the surface characteristics of urban environment, the materials, the lack of vegetation, and also the density of population. So a lot of people are exposed to, to these extreme events. Next slide, please. A recent study uh, conducted by AWRI provided an estimation of change in heat projection indicators in 1,000 cities based on global climate downscaled models and based on comparing uh, two global warming scenarios, 1.5 and 3 degrees global warming. And we see a significant increase in different heat metrics and cooling demand. In Istanbul, for example, we notice an increase of 80% of heat wave duration for three degree scenarios, and a significant increase also in cooling degree days as a proxy of cooling demand. Next slide, please. So in WRI, we are working closely with different city officials uh, in different countries to provide data analysis and technical assistance to transform how we build our cities toward passive cooling infrastructure to improve health, equity, livability, and resilience. So we are, for example, uh, working in implementing cooling infrastructure and effective surfaces in cities in United States, in India, in Mexico, in Cape Town, as part of Data for Cool Cities project. We are also working uh, in Brazil, uh, connected to what Bruno presented, estimating the health impact of heat uh, events in Brazilian cities, and also working in improving data collection and uh, implementing community-based heat mapping campaigns in Nairobi and Africa. So this is, we are doing that with different partners that are helping us to connect better with city officials and urban decision makers. My colleague Elizabeth leading the heat data and modeling activities in a couple of these cities and will present the methods and the data we are using for supporting city officials in reducing heat exposures through cooling infrastructure. So. Thank you, Steve. And uh, thanks for letting us present today. Uh, so as we've heard, the built environment of a city and the way that a neighborhood is constructed can really make a difference in how people feel when they're outside. As the world gets hotter, and in particular cities get hotter, the way that we build and design cities can be a tool in helping protect people. We know that these urban design strategies for cooling work because as we saw, they've been tested, including nature-based solutions and passive cooling. Heat resilient infrastructure like reflective materials on roofs and roads, trees and other forms of shade and green space. All of them can make a difference and can make a big difference when used in combination. Just not just in whether a neighborhood itself is hot or cool, but in particular how people feel when they stand outside in that neighborhood. So in order to help cities understand and implement urban design solutions for heat, our team at WRI is producing high resolution maps of urban surfaces, modeling hyperlocal heat exposure, and evaluating the effects of specific interventions. We want to help answer the questions that Bruno mentioned, what do we do and where do we start? We've developed methods for producing high resolution land use land cover data with categories relevant to implementing cooling infrastructure like parks, roads, buildings, and parking lots. The data, which we've named Open Urban, combines globally available free and open source data sets to create a continuous map of urban surfaces. We're currently working to validate the accuracy of the data set, but in the United States, the overall accuracy is 93%. We are then able to use this data to assess baseline conditions in cities and as input into our thermal models to understand how these surfaces contribute to heat. But we need the right metrics to answer the right questions. And although we all know what it's like to be hot, heat is complicated to measure and exists in multiple ways within a city. First, there's land surface temperature. This is what we're used to seeing when we're looking at maps of cities. 
It's measured with satellites, which is great because it means that it's being continuously measured at the global scale. However, what it measures is the temperature of surfaces, the tops of buildings, the tops of trees, the surface of the street. And that doesn't really relate to how hot people feel outdoors and it doesn't have a direct impact on health. Air temperature is another way to measure heat that's generally measured by sensors and is what's in the weather report, but it's also an incomplete way of understanding heat. Air temperature doesn't vary a lot at the city scale, but we all know that it can feel quite different standing in the sun or in the shade. So our team is modeling the Universal Thermal Comfort Index, or UTCI, which is a composite index that combines a number of things, including air temperature, humidity, wind, and radiation from the sun, and radiation that's reflected from surfaces. What UTCI measures is how the human body experiences outdoor conditions. And although it's reported in degrees Celsius, like air temperature, what it really measures is the total heat load from all these different sources on the human body. And we can measure this with a high level of spatial detail to understand how hot you feel in a given place at a given time. This way we can map that difference in thermal comfort between the sun and the shade, or how different it feels standing in a nice green park versus the middle of a parking lot. We are modeling hyperlocal heat exposure by combining data about cities, including three-dimensional data on the height of buildings and trees, land cover, and meteorological data to understand the individual thermal burden of people moving through these spaces. We are using the model to calculate two thermal comfort indices, mean radiant temperature and UTCI, as well as producing shade maps. Although currently we rely on high resolution 3D data from cities, we are also developing and testing methods to model heat exposure at slightly lower resolutions using globally available data. And this gives us really detailed maps of the heat infrastructure of a city. You can see on the left, the percent cover of impervious and pervious surfaces. In the middle, the average shade throughout the course of the day. And on the right, the existing tree canopy all of which contribute to the thermal environment of cities. We are able to model heat exposure at any time of day under any meteorological conditions. On the left, we see a map of the UTCI in Cape Town at 3 p.m. local time on a very hot day, with the lighter colors representing a higher heat burden on people in those areas. On the right, you can see how UTCI changes throughout the day and how it differs between land cover and shade. Unsurprisingly, areas with unshaded pavement, which is represented by the solid red line, have the highest UTCI throughout the day, while shaded grass, the dashed green line, have the lowest. And not only are we able to model heat exposure for existing conditions in cities, we're also modeling heat exposure if conditions change. We are designing scenarios that map what the city might look like if various kinds of heat resilient infrastructure are implemented with the focus on designing scenarios to achieve realistic policy goals. For our pilot project, we are starting with three interventions, planting street trees, erecting shade structures and parks with little existing shade and converting large buildings to cool roofs. As an example, this is a scenario for planting street trees in Cape Town. On the left, you see the road network along with the existing trees in green and the areas where we estimate that trees can be planted in yellow. This takes into account a minimum distance from roads and buildings as well as the current land surfaces. We chose a particularly hot and unshaded street to model the effects of planting trees and the size and height of modeled trees are derived from statistics on the existing tree canopy. In the top middle panel, you can see the difference in shade resulting from the new trees, and on the bottom, the difference in heat exposure. On the right, we've quantified the actual cooling potential, and you can see that by lining the street with trees, it will feel about 13 degrees cooler in that area. We're evaluating the effects of different scenarios alone and in combination, knowing that they'll work differently and that scenarios will be more or less appropriate in different cities. 
We're also turning all of this into a data platform that we're building in collaboration with a number of city partners to both make this data available and to provide a way to work more closely with cities to help them understand, prioritize, and implement heat resilient infrastructure and guide urban transformation. We're currently testing this platform and we welcome any feedback or interest in collaboration. We would love to hear from you, so please get in touch and thank you so much. Panelin son konuşmacısı WRI Türkiye Kentsel Hareketlilik Yöneticisi Sayın Cemil Oğuz. Buyurun Cemil Bey. Merhaba herkese. WRI Road Center tarafından fonlanan İstanbul Derinlemesine Çalışma Progr e, Programı'nın devam eden ve başlayacak olan iki projemizi kentsel ısı açısından ele al alarak anlatacağım size. Devam eden projemiz İstanbul Mahalle Odaklı Aktif Ulaşım Planlama Çalışması'dır. Proje alanımız İstanbul Kadıköy ilçesi Cafer Ağa Mahallesi'dir. Projenin amacı İstanbul'da aktif ulaşım ile yapılan yolculukların %5, %10 oranında artırılması, e, e, artırılmasını mahalle bazlı aktif hareketlilik planlama projesiyle sağlamaktır. Projenin paydaşları WRI Türkiye, İstanbul Büyükşehir Belediyesi ve Kadıköy Belediyesi'dir. Çalışma alanı 480 bin nüfuslu Kadıköy ilçesinin e, yaklaşık 23 bin nüfuslu Cafer Ağa Mahallesi'dir. Cafer Ağa günlük 2.3 milyon ziyaretçi ağırlamaktadır. Cafer Ağa Mahallesi İBB tarafından 2023 yılında sürdürülebilir kentsel hareketlilik planı kapsamında düşük emisyon bölgesi olarak belirlenmiştir. Proje sürecinde ulaşımı hem aktif hareketlilik hem de kentsel ısı açısından ele aldık. Haritadan da görüleceği üzere ana toplu taşıma hatları Cafer Ağa Mahallesi'nin sınırlarına kadar gelmektedir ancak içeriye girmemektedir. Mahalle içerisinde ve sadece mali hizmet veren moda tramvay hattı vardır. Ağırlıkta arazi kullanımına bakıldığında mahallenin kuzeyi ticaret ve orta kısmı da konut artı ticaret ağırlıklı kullanıma sahiptir. Bu bölgelerde yeme içme, eğlence ve giyim sektörü ağırlıklıdır. Projenin toplam 3 ana aktivite, aktivitesi var. Kapasite geliştirme çalışmaları, yaşanabilir mahalle yaklaşımı ile konsept plan üretimi ve kılavuz rapor hazırlanması. Kapasite geliştirme çalışmalarında İBB ve Kadıköy Belediyesi personellerine yönelik toplam 4 tane eğitim verilmiştir. Bunlar mahalle odaklı planlama yaklaşımı, veri toplama ve değerlendirme yöntemleri, iklim değişikliği ve iletişim. İklim değişikliği eğitiminde İklim değişikliğinin sebepleri, şehirler için neden ajandı, ajandaya alınması gereken bir konu olduğu, kentsel gelişim ile iklim değişikliğinin nasıl entegre edilebileceği, entegre iklim eylem hakkında bilgi verildi. Sonrasında da İstanbul ile ilişkisi üzerinde tartışıldı. İkinci aktivitemiz yaşanabilir mahalle odaklı konsept plan üretimidir. Bu kısımda İBB ve Kadı, Kadıköy Belediyesi'nden temin ettiğimiz planlama ve ulaşım verilerinin detaylı analizlerini yaptık. Sonrasında sağ, sağda trafik sayımı, yolculuk anketleri ve sokak kesit çalışmalarını yaptık. Son olarak da akademi, STK, kamu, özel sektör ve yerel temsilcilerin katılımıyla mevcut durumu detaylı görmemizi sağlayan çalıştay serisi düzenledik. Çalıştay serisinin üçüncüsü ısı adalarının yürünebilirliğe etkisidir. Global Volcability Correspondence Network ile birlikte geliştirdiğimiz bu çalıştayda Cafer Ağa Mahallesi'nin yürünebilirlik kalitesini ısı adaları açısından ele aldık. Çalıştaya sağ çalışması ve e, atölye olarak kur kurguladık. Sağ çalışmasında Filler One Termal Görüntüleme Teknolojisini kullandık. Ekranın sağ kısmında gördüğünüz Cafer Ağa haritasındaki noktalar... Ve bu noktaları e, bağlayan sokaklarda yüzey ölçümleri yapıldı. Isı ölçümleri dışında malzeme, ulaşım, yeşil örtü, gölge elemanları, hava kalitesi, atık ve su elemanları gibi ölçütler de sahada incelendi. Ölçümlerde en yüksek ve en düşük yüzey sıcaklıkları, odak noktası sıcaklıkları ve baskın renkler histogramı üzerinden analiz yapıldı. Farklı yüzey malzemelerinin ve renklerinin değişen yüzey sıcaklıklarına sahip olduğu gözlemlendi. Daha koyu renklere özellikle siyah sahip yüzeyler malzeme türünden bağımsız olarak daha hafif malzemelere kıyasla önemli ölçüde daha yüksek sıcaklıklar göstererek daha fazla ısı emdiği tespit edildi. 
Yeşil alanlarda doğal ve yapay çimlerin farklı yüzey sıcaklıkları sergilediği belirlendi. Halı şeklinde döşenen çimlerin plastik materyal içermesi nedeniyle ısıyı soğurmadığı gözlemlendi. Bu saha çalışması aynı zamanda doğa tabanlı çözümlerin kentsel ısının azaltılmasında etkili bir yaklaşım olacağını e, katılımcılara uygulamalı olarak gösterdi. Sağdaki rekreasyon alanı her ne kadar yürüme odaklı bir yaklaşımla planlanmış olsa da kente uygun yeşil örtü ve malzeme turu iyi kurgulanmadığı için 46.7 dereceye kadar çıkan yüzey sıcaklığı ölçülmüştür. Bu da konforlu bir açık alan kullanımını engellemektedir. Tabii ki kentsel ısı sadece yanlış malzeme türü, e, rengi ve yeşil alanların eksikliğinden kaynaklanmamaktadır. Yoğun motorlu araç kullanımı da önemli bir etkendir. Sağ çalışmasında izlenen güzergah aynı zamanda trafik akışının yoğun olduğu bölgelerdir. Aktif hareket eden, duran ancak çalışan araçlar, özellikle üstü açık otopark alanları gibi trafik etkenleri de kentsel ısıyı önemli ölçüde artırmaktadır. Sağ çalışmamızdan sonra yürütülen atölye çalışmasında malzeme kalitesinde ısı azaltan malzemelerin kentsel yenileme, gelişme ve tasarım çalışmalarında start, standart olarak belirlenmesi, emisyon azaltımı için elektrikli toplu taşımanın teşvik edilmesi, yollarda, açık alanlarda ve sokaklarda ağaçlandırmanın ve düzenli bakımlarının yapılması ve spor, dinlenme ve otopark gibi açık alanlarda gölgeliklerin oluşturulması önerileri getirildi. Projemizin devam eden aşamalarında geliştirilen öneri sokak çalışmalarında da bu çalıştayın çıktılarını kentsel ısıyı düşürecek, araç yoğunluğunu azaltacak taktiksel şehircilik uygulamaları kullanılmıştır. Gördüğünüz bu örnekte doğal üst örtü kullanımı önerilmiştir. Bu öneride ise ağaçlandırma ve yağmur suyunu toplayacak geçirgen yüzey önerisi ön plana çıkmaktadır. Bu ve bir sonra göstereceğim öneride de ağaçlandırma ve hız azaltımı için şikan uygulaması ön plandadır. Bir sonraki projemiz olan kentsel hareketlilik planlarında doğa tabanlı çözümlerin ilçe düzeyinde entegrasyonu demin anlattığım projenin devamı niteliğindedir. Çalışma alanı Kadıköy ilçesinin tamamıdır. Projenin amacı ilçe düzeyinde kentsel hareketlilik ve doğa tabanlı çözümler e, planının tamamlanmasıdır. Proje 19 ay sürmesi planlanmış e, olarak kullan Proje 19 ay olarak kurgulandı. Doğa tabanlı çözümlere ve aktif hareketliliğe odaklanmaktadır. Bir önceki projenin çıktıları ilçe genelini kapsayan anket çalışması ve proje paydaşları olan İBB ve Kadıköy Belediyesi'nden ilgili belirlerin temini ile Kadıköy ilçesinin ulaşım altyapısının aktif hareketlilik ve doğa tabanlı çözümleri açısından mevcut durum değerlendirme çalışması yapılacaktır. Doğa tabanlı çözümler odak odaklı kapasite geliştirme eğitimlerinden sonra Kadıköy ilçesi kentsel hareketlilik ve doğa tabanlı çözümler konsept planı ve kılavuz raporu hazırlanacaktır. Beni dinlediğiniz için teşekkür ederim. Teşekkürler Cemil Bey. Böylelikle panelimizin sunum kısmını tamamlamış oluyoruz. Şimdi soru cevap kısmına geçebiliriz. Bruno'ya şöyle bir soru var. Şehirler Halkı ve paydaşları bu kentsel ısı adasıyla olan mücadeleye karar alma süreçlerine nasıl dahil edebiliyorlar? Bu anlattığınız çalışmalarda bunlar nasıl başarıldı? So yeah, this is a important and key uh, question because the engagement of communities is very important. There are many local dynamics that maps do not capture, and for, in order to create effective Uh, solutions and solutions that will address the needs of people, you need to get their insights and you need to get them in the process. The way we do this is that we engage them from the beginning in the design process, forming uh, working groups, delivering workshops and getting them engaged from the very early stages, from diagnostics to the design of the solutions, capturing insights, because that's the way, the best way you have to get buy-in and create the proper communication around your project. Also, it gives you a space to adjust the, the track if needed and, and validate your ideas. Thank you so much. Jesse'ye bulunmakta bir soru. Kentsel ısı ve kentsel ısı adaları savunması grupları nasıl etkilemekte? Bunları nasıl en aza indirebiliriz bu etkileri? 
it's the issue the closest to my heart because um, there is this overlapping effect of the urban heat island with cities most vulnerable. And so you have the people with the least resources and capacity to cope with extreme heat living in the hottest parts of the city very often. And so it's like a sort of double jeopardy in terms of that pressure on the most vulnerable. Um, we have been trying to find lots of different ways to support the most vulnerable. Uh, particularly those that find themselves in those hot areas of the city without those those resources to be able to respond to heat. And so cooling centers is one way of uh, creating a space where people can go to cool off, especially when you have prolonged heat waves. Um, and that's been a really effective mechanism that Red Cross and Red Crescent National Societies have used to give folks in those areas a place to go to cool off. Um, as well as water points and distribution of water, mobile health units. Uh, in Greece, uh, the National Society has a mobile health unit that has a nurse and first aiders that can travel around to those areas, particularly uh, perhaps reaching out to uh, homeless who have nowhere else to go to cool off in order to uh, do wellness checks, to provide first aid, and even to potentially help them to move to health facilities if they are really in crisis, or even potentially to move to uh, cooling centers. And, uh, and, and making sure that you have systems in place to check in on the most vulnerable. Like I said, very often, uh, especially in Europe, uh, in urban areas, those that are, are uh, dying of extreme heat have co comorbidities or other health related issues um, and uh, find themselves potentially isolated and alone at home. And it's a very similar phenomenon to the sort of impact that COVID had on those vulnerable, isolated households where uh, they weren't getting support, they were more likely to get sick, and then they were not getting the treatment they needed. Uh, and we see that with extreme heat. And so wellness checks, having systems where volunteers check on people to make sure that they are okay uh, can be really critical. And one of the things we saw in Greece that was sort of tragic and I think would be quite similar probably in Istanbul is that uh, people might've had a neighbor, an elderly person might've had a neighbor that would check in on them. But in the summer, in the hottest months of the summer, those neighbors go on holidays, they go south. And so those folks are just that much more isolated um, uh, in those moments without those coping mechanisms or those support mechanisms around them. So creating alternative uh, options for them to be able to, um, to have someone checking in on them and potentially helping them to access care if they need it. Part of this. As we've talked about, it's we don't see heat as a natural hazard. People don't know the difference between a hot day and a dangerously hot day. Uh, and there is lots of good science and data around there, around now about where where it is the hottest, where people are most vulnerable, and uh, and how we can respond. And so there is an opportunity that we can bring these pieces together and really do more to support the most vulnerable in our communities. Thank you, Jesse. Ee, bir sonraki sorumuz ise Cemil Bey'e. Mevcut projenizden bahsettiniz. Bir sonraki projenizde bölge seçim kriterleriniz neler olacak? Şöyle söyleyebilirim. Şimdi başlayacak olan projemizin üçüncü aşamasında kentsel ısı adası etkilerini azaltmak ve aktif ulaşım olanaklarını arttırmak için doğa tabanlı çözümleri Kadıköy ilçesi genelinde planlarımıza dahil etmeyi hedefliyoruz. Ancak projenin süresi tüm ilçe genelinde detaylı bir çalışma yapmaya olanak vermiyor. E, bu yüzden veri analizlerine dayanarak önceliklendirmesi gereken 5-6 bölgeyi belirleyeceğiz. Yani bu bölgeleri de kentsel ısı adası e, etkisinin nüfus ve yoğun e, nüfus ve trafik yoğunluğunun yüksek olduğu ve yeşillendirme, gölgelendirme ihtiyacının olduğu alanlar olacak. Bu öncelikli alanlar belirledikten sonra da İBB ve Kadıköy Belediyesi işbirliğinde nihai olarak hangi bölge üzerinde çalışacağımıza karar vereceğiz. Ee, tabii bu da e, e, yani ortaya çıkılacak olan çözümü scale up yapılabilmesi için bir altlık da oluşturmuş olacak. Sonra devam eden süreç, e, süreci de katılımcılarla e, e, yapacağız. Yani öneri çalışmalarını da onlarla birlikte geliştireceğiz. Teşekkür ederim. Biz teşekkür ederiz ve son sorumuz. 
Sayık ve Elizabeth için. Üretilen veri ve araçların uygulanmasını sağlamak için şehirlerle nasıl bir etkileşim içerisindesiniz? Uh, first of all, we started our project by uh, having different interviews with city officials from different departments to understand their needs and to be sure that the data that we are planning to produce and the tool that we are planning to develop are really connected with the contextual needs of the cities. And uh, so we are having close interaction with city officials from different departments. We are involving them in the co-design of the tool development, and we are getting their early feedback from the beginning. So we to share with them the results of the maps, and we try to understand how much these maps can be transformed into uh, decisions and into actions. So, and they are also involved uh, in our uh, in, in the user testing approach. So we we share with them the the the tool, the wireframe of the tools, and the mockup, and we try to collect feedback from their uh, from different uh, city officials on how they interact with these with these uh, functionalities and how they can use them in their uh, uh, to address the challenges that they're, that they're having. So be, through this process, we understood that there are different uh, needs based on this. So we are trying to to to provide some generic application that can serve the different cities, but we are also uh, developing specific services uh, contextualized to the city's needs based on their urgent needs and also based on their uh, existing strategy and intervention to be sure that we are aligned with what they are doing and what they are projecting to implement and also to be aligned with their constraints. Çok teşekkürler. Peki soru cevap bölümümüzün sonuna gelmiş bulunmaktayız. Ben tüm panelistlerimize, siz değerli katılımcılarımıza bu panele katıldığınız için teşekkür ederim. Şimdi 10 dakikalık bir aramız olacak. Hemen ardından eylemde doğa temelli çözümler oturumuyla devam edeceğiz. Görüşmek üzere.